thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Brandon. Uh, this is a very uh, ill-organized panel on my front, so we're just going to <laughs> going to be very, very casual and conversational. It's a group of artists who I'm really excited about. Um, it's uh, Liz Suburbia next to me, who's uh, put out her recent book, Sacred Heart, which Fanographics published, which is the thing that I've been. <laughs> I was going to say I've been gushing about it for years, but I've kind of been gushing about uh, all these guys' work for years. Gross. And uh, next to Liz is, is Farrell Dowrymple, who uh, I've, been, I've been besties with for like half my life now. Yeah, wow, that is uh, yeah. true, man. Yeah, going old together. <laughs> and, uh, and Farrell does Pop Gun War and Wrenchies and all these fantastic books. And on the end, in the, uh, <laughs> the gentleman I shared my bed with last night. <laughs> nothing, nothing sexy. I created a wall between us, apparently completely unconscious. Nothing sexy. Speak for yourself. <laughs> no, no, I think Ron, I was plenty sexy. Ron's a sensual man. <laughs> no, but uh, Ron, I think the, the biggest book of yours now is uh, Prince of Cats, yeah. that, that Vertigo uh, started to handle the world and that fell on. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's an amazing book if you guys haven't seen it. Mm. And yeah. a bunch of books with no said release dates. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah, later. and there's there's lots of. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I thank you guys for coming. Mm. This is uh, I I don't know how familiar everyone is with everyone's work, but uh, I feel like we've all kind of if if you're familiar with my work, then I've certainly uh, pushed these guys' work on on other people. Um, and vice versa. <laughs> yeah, so I, I wrote down two questions uh, because, you know, we, we only have like an hour plus. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, uh, initially I wanted to talk about kind of what uh, all, each of you's idea of being a cartoonist, because you're all very much lifelong cartoonists, mm -hmm. and I want to talk about the idea of, of each of you's idea of being a cartoonist when you're kids and, and being like, I'm going to do this with my life mm -hmm. versus the reality of being uh, an adult mm -hmm. cartoonist who has to get groceries and pay rent and look yourself in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, would you even want to start on that? Me? Uh, yes. mm. Well, yeah. Well, my mom is here, so she was there when it all started. Oh, yeah, no swears. Yeah. <laughs> swears. My mom curses like a sailor. <laughs> no, she don't, though. She do, though. Um, yeah, so I started out, uh, yeah, the, the myth, or like the sort of like the myth of cartooning. Can, yeah, you can go into I didn't really, certainly. I think I first started to think about cartooning as a life choice. I mean, I always drew, you know, I, I loved stories, I loved animation. Um, I didn't really grow up, I guess I read newspaper strips, like I used to get the, you know, newspaper, Charlie Brown, all of that, I was really into that. Um, but the idea of being a cartoonist kind of came while I was in college because I had a skill set and I felt like, I don't know, it seems stupid now, but I felt like, uh, <clears throat> or silly, I need a way to make money. So with this, this, this skill set, so like I'll be a cartoonist, like it's, it seems ridiculous to say that, but like that, that's, what, that's what I thought. Like, Ron, was video game character designer ever on your thing? Because that um, feels like the teenager thing. It's like, I'm going to do comics and video game character designer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to, like, draw. I did a whole, like, sheets, like, Street Fighter yeah. sheets, like, pose sets and stuff. Yeah, no, I would have loved to have done video game stuff back then. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, we used to draw. Um, uh, my cousin is here, too. I don't know if you remember. We used to draw, like, the characters out of the game books. And, like, you know, we'd, you know, draw Mario characters or whatnot. And we'd make our own characters. Or I'd make my own characters, you know. Yeah. No, it's... I still want to do that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, where the money's at, anyway. So, yeah. yeah, but I mean, is that even uh, I don't know, like if you got that job now, would it be as exciting, or would it? Would you have to kind mm. of remind yourself of being a kid and being excited about it? Uh, I, you know, I it'd have to be some type of game that deals with the t the stuff that I deal with in my <laughs> comics, right? <laughs> like if it's if it's like a you know, there'd have to be some sort of a, a weirdness to it. Like, if it's a Street Fighter game, then it would have to be, like, something where, you know, it's a comment on, like, all of those different exotic characters and tropes, you know what I mean? Like, right. it'd have to be something funny, you know, like, or, 
but I think I could get into it. It's just that type of work. I've done some like work in animation and um, right, Black Dynamite recently. Yeah, but it takes you know like it's a huge endeavor, um, and you are you are a cog in a machine too. You know, so with comics, it's fun because you can you know you do everything. Right? Yeah. yeah, you can. You put your fingers in all the pies. And both of and you guys in the end are kind of <laughs> formally art educated, right? Liz, did yeah. you go to art school? Uh, I went to school for art. In like a, <laughs> yeah, a small kind of southern college with a small arts program. So. But was it? Were, were, was comics your focus at that time? No, not at all. I mean, I was I was drawing comics in my spare time, but I never. I mean, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a, a veterinarian. You know, I never. I don't think I ever thought that I would do comics on the level I'm doing them now, let alone like as a career. Like I still, I have a day job that I do comics around and that's mm. part of what took the book so long to come out was cause I <laughs> had to squeeze it in around, you know, overtime and paying bills and, um, and I, I still don't know like, I mean, I, I wanna, I'm hoping that with the money this book earns, I can like go back to school, you know, and, and start another career that I like, you know, I'd like to try teaching or, mm something like that and I, I still don't really see myself um, trying to make my living only on comics both for financial reasons and because I know that paying your bills with it means you've got to take on a lot of work and I think it puts that work under a microscope or gives it a context of pressure that I'm really sensitive to and that my work definitely suffers <laughs> mm. for so so I don't know. I mean, I guess we'll see where the future takes us. Sure. I feel like that is very much connects the idea of like art versus craft even, because it's very much feels like when you're professionally doing what you love, you have to kind of just wash dishes sometimes and kind of just do the things that are, gets it done rather than, than what you're, but I mean, even putting together your own book has a lot of that, right? Yeah, you know, it was, I wanted to quit a lot over the, <laughs> over the course of it, you know, even something that you love has, has really difficult times doing it, but um, I mean, a lot of it's a lot of it's kind of just keeping perspective. You know, I'm I'm never not grateful to be able to do it, and I'm I'm not gonna like complain because I can't just pay my bills with it. You know, it's like we all gotta survive or live our lives however they end up, and you know, if I can get to squeeze comics in there somewhere, that's good enough for me most of the time. Hmm. Oh, Farrell, do you, do you think, because you went to School of Visual Arts. <clears throat> yeah, I went to uh, SVA as like an older person. I'm easily the oldest person on this panel, and I don't know if in this room, but uh, <laughs> one of the older people at the show. Kind of probably. grossly youthful looking. Yeah. I'm constantly I'll telling think. people, Farrell's older than me, and they're just like, really? Do you, <laughs> do you <laughs> smoke? Do you drink a lot? <laughs> <clears throat> I was hoping you'd say something like that. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, I don't know, when I was a young person, like a little child, uh, I don't know, I, I, I knew that I wanted to be a cartoonist. Like that was like, I don't know, it's like something like I had like, for as long as I've been able to think about stuff like what I want to do. Uh, so I knew I wanted to make comic books because I always was, I mean, I was, ever since I could draw, I was like drawing comics uh, just for my own amusement or what have you. And, uh, but there was like some point when I, uh, you know, became an adult or something, right? I thought about that too. It was like, well, how am I gonna make a living doing this, you know, I like drawing and painting and things like that. So when I went to art school, it was, I didn't study cartooning. I, I, uh, and you had to make this decision all on your bar mitzvah day? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, uh, I, think, I think by the time I went to SVA, I was like 23 and I had transferred in as a, a, a sophomore because I went to a junior college and that was mm -hmm. kind of like the idea too, it was like, I couldn't afford art school. I, you know, I didn't have a, like a benefactor, like rich parents or anything. So uh, I just kind of, sort of figured out how to do like student loans and get grants and stuff to do get like all my uh, uh, whatever you call those the requisites and stuff out of the right. way. You know, English classes and science and all that stuff at junior college. And then so by, by the time I went to SVA, it was like mostly just studio classes. Yeah. And um, and what you know, studying studying illustration there because I oh I have to make a living doing this art thing uh, and then while I was there I was like I don't want to do illustration this is horrible I have to deal with like art directors and editors and things like that and I knew I didn't want to like you know draw spider-man or whatever just because that 
Didn't you seem like the Spider-Man. Point. But you Spider-Man. I, have, I have drawn Spider-Man, but I mean, like, <laughs> do, doing a... I think we've all drawn Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah. But. Well, even, like, you know, we doing... We doing... book drawn Spider-Man. Though, oh, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, the Death of Wolverine <laughs> yeah. or something. Uh, I didn't draw Spider-Man, though. Oh, he refused. <laughs> I refused. <laughs> But it, uh, just like doing, I knew that I wasn't, wouldn't be capable of doing like a monthly book or just having like that pressure to, to, to draw from like a script or something would just kind of ruin any enjoyment I would get out of doing comic yeah. books. So I thought like, oh, illustration or whatever would do, you know, supplement my income. But I, you know, I realized at some point it's like, uh, it's, it was better for me to, you know, work at a coffee shop or an art supply store or a restaurant or something than doing this thing for the man, you know, and kind of destroying my spirit. It's like, well, if I'm going to have my spirit destroyed, I'd rather have, I'd rather have the soul crushing work be something that I wouldn't take home with me, yeah. you know? And so like while I was, you know, busting tables and imagining smashing glasses in people's faces, it would just be like, I have to go home and draw comics. And so I'd stay up all night drawing comics and, right. you know, and then at some point, um, you know, I was able to quit the, quit the day job and, you know, do enough you know, a little bit of paying work, you know, comic work or artwork or illustration work or whatever, you know, to supplement my, you know, my comics work. Um, it's, whenever that happened, it kind of did have that effect where I wouldn't work on my comics as, in the same, with the same energy and passion that I had when I had Yeah, the, that know? recovery time that just like, it's like, <laughs> it's like having a wound heal when you do something yeah. with, your, with your work that you don't like. Yeah. But it was something you said before, kind of tied into. I think I think Ron, you were talking about this on the on the panel that I missed. But I heard you know rumors and whispers of in the ether <laughs> about how uh, you know the, and the kind of the 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 prompt of the original question was when you're talking about how the reality, the financial. Or this mm-hmm. is all very boring. How we're just <laughs> how I'm just hemming and pushing you guys into talking about how little money you all make. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but there's also the I have good. Two. I have good. Uh, you know that that's the whole. That's what's so confusing about it. It's like, I'll have a year that's like, okay, no, I'm good. Like, yeah, I done it, right? And then I'll have another year where I'll be like, ooh, like, wow, where is everybody? You know, like, <laughs> no one wants to talk to me, right? Like, I remember, yeah, the first time I did the Angoulême residency, I, had, I actually had a, a rough couple of years. I was staying on my buddy's um, couch. And when I was on his couch, I got the Criterion job, I got a Nike job, like, you know, you know, and you get a Nike job, and it's like you just don't work for you know three or four months. Like it, it changed, it changed the way I thought about uh, doing corporate work. You know, but it got me off of a couch. Because you, you said know? at one point that you don't like to turn jobs down because it hurts you. Yeah, well, how do you like? What, what was it? I think we were, we were just talking on Twitter, and I was, I was basically like. Um, I like to I like to be smug from my ivory tower and just be like yeah. I never worked a day in my life yeah. and you're just like I can't turn jobs down but it's like yeah. I, I often forget that me and you are in different because I I feel like I've kind of built a name by being a dick sometimes mm. to people and just like um, like I am very like I will I will live tweet rejecting uh, you know emails from Marvel or something mm. and be like these guys wrote me again I'm never working for them <laughs> and, but I feel like. Um, I'm sure you talked about it on the other panel too, but you had the uh, the Nib comic you did about yeah. about being asked to lighten a character. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also sabotaged my career. I I don't know. <laughs> you know I, like I don't. You know. I heard but you I got mean, some was... image books coming up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but like, I, it is interesting because you handled that. Um, you handled that really well, I thought, but you handled it a lot more politely than I would have been able to. Well, my my point wasn't to really like, I don't know. Uh, point a finger at make someone feel bad for like being a uh, um, an arm of like <laughs> you know institutionalized right. racism right <laughs> like I mean you know like, to put it frankly um, and I, I wanted to have a discussion and I wanted people who read the comic to uh, come away with it with like okay well that's exactly how this dude felt about it and this is why he felt that way about it now and it doesn't mean that this person you know, like, I feel like the first, there are a couple times in that comic where I'm like, yo, I actually have no beef with this woman. And yeah. I actually, she, we had a really great time working together, you know? Um, it seemed really diplomatic to me. Like, it didn't seem like there was any career Yeah, I'm talking about someone who I worked with, who I would work yeah. with again. But, like, then the response happened. And yeah. I was like, okay, so nah, like, well, what's crazy is something happened to me. Let me tell a quick story. <laughs> I just, I just came back from New Orleans. I went to a, a wedding there, right? 
And I was, um, I was standing in the kitchen of this house where they had the wedding. And like, uh, but everyone's hanging out there, like fr friends and family of the wedding. Then I hear a Southern, like uh, Yosemite Sam, like, or like, a, what's the name of the Foghorn Leghorn? Like, <laughs> voice, right? It's like a cartoon Southern voice, right? And he's like, I say, uh, well, if you ain't getting, if you ain't making drinks, then get out the way. You know, and I'm like, okay, now, <clears throat> That could be exactly what I think it is, or it could be someone like a colorful relative, like uh, I don't, I could, like it just was so racist. I was like, wow, like that's spectacular racist. Like that's not like, <laughs> you know, like that's not like, oh man, did I get that job? I wonder if I got that job. Then you walked out and you noticed like nobody else there was black at the, at the place and you're like, is there some racist shit going on here? It's like, nah, it's like, yo, that motherfucker just said you were the help. Right? <laughs> and then I, and like, I look around at some people and they're like, oh, maybe he didn't mean it that way. Then I look across at my uh, home, homie's uh, wife and she's like, she's, <laughs> like, she's from Australia, right? So she just saw some like real American shit. It was like, you know what I mean? Like, she's like, oh, wow, that's what it is. And that's you like know? growing up in prison. That's American racism. It's not like, it's not like killing aboriginals. Like this is the, this is like, this is like some American, you know? And so, but still, I was like, okay, I was in the wedding party, right? I still was like, maybe that wasn't racist. And then, okay, I'm standing next, I'm standing next to the groom. We do the whole ceremony. Then afterwards, the guy comes up and apologizes. And then I'm like, oh, shit, so you did mean it that way. And that's how I felt about, like, the X-Men thing. It was like, right. okay, um, maybe, you know, you know it's, she, she's not thinking that much about it. And, like, it's not a big deal, right? Like, but then when Axel responded the way he did, you know, and, and kind of like in the flippant sort of way. It's right. like, no, you know, well, I'm Latino and uh, there's nothing, you know, nothing, nothing to see here. Like, no, it's, it's, I mean, I, I, and here are some new black yeah. characters. No, I love Check that. Check it out. <laughs> I love that Latino, Latino people have never done anything wrong in the history. Of right. <laughs> you know, like, well, I mean, the, the whole thing is like, yo, well, yeah, you're Latino, but like, uh, maybe you should use that empathy that you have right. and connect to people and hire people more consistently and have that be reflected in your in your books and they're doing they're a corporation like not everyone you know like they're doing some things right but I'm not touching it anymore you know like overall I think they just have I can't condone their type of behavior so I won't I won't work with with them anymore either so yeah, anyway, I, think it's very I don't know why we got into all of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was, uh, Axel was the editor at Marvel, right, that you uh, talked to right before you tagged up their bathroom? Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it was the worst. I, I don't know. I don't even need to turn this into a shit-talking. Uh, you just turn no, it. let's do but it. But that's yeah, why you guys it. came here, though, right? <laughs> you <laughs> came here to hear us talk shit the whole no, time. No, no, that's true. Um, <laughs> it was, it's, a, it's just a dumb story. Like, I was super hungry and desperate for work, mm -hmm. and I was just like to get an interview in Marvel or DC was like uh, the pearly gates. And I was like, I'm gonna talk to the angel at the clipboard. And I go up there and I'm really nervously like showing uh, the, the guy who's now the head of chief, the head of publisher or whatever of Marvel, my portfolio and he's flipping through it and he's like, he, the while he's doing it, he's bragging about like, he's like, yeah, I pretty much like re revitalized Vertigo and everything. Mm. And then he closed my portfolio and he's like, this is pretty good. If I was still at my last job, I'd give you a work, I'd give you work right now. But we do better here at Marvel. <laughs> oh, oh fuck. and it was just I like, and I, I I got a lot of that stuff because I was mm. a you know a dirty teenager mm. that didn't realize I should put on a clean shirt to go to an interview and things mm. like that. But uh, yeah, it wasn't it didn't it didn't endear me ten years later to him. The smugness that people have, and it's like, yo, you realize you work in comics, right? Like we're not. Yeah, we're not at like the Paris Review. But I hope that's the smugness right. comes from that of like working at you like you, you know, didn't I, I said some cheesy thing off a, off a rap song to you yesterday where it's like peacock struck because they don't know how to fly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I feel, I feel too with a lot of those guys, uh, you know, Marvel and DC editors or even like, you know, a lot of people that just read that type of stuff. It's like, to them that is comics. Yeah. Like it's like nothing, I mean, they wouldn't even think that there's... Like so much well, you more. You know that story that you told me about your your friends with the Rick Remender who writes all that <laughs> stuff, and he took you to a, a dinner where um, 
they a lot of them were like, whatever happened to that David Mazzucchelli guy? Yeah, <laughs> I know. It was like, and yeah, it, I didn't say did anything the whole, the whole like, meal, but yeah. Yeah, just lots of like very, yeah. well, maybe that's good. Maybe it's awesome that you can be in comics and not know every comic that came out this week. I also got to hear uh, Frank Cho make lots of uh, gay <laughs> jokes towards me, and I was like, yeah, I'm gay, okay? Wow. Like, can you just stop? He's, uh, <laughs> he's a charmer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I just met him, too. I was like, all right. So, okay, Perfect. so the state of in, indie comics, right? Are is we that, supposed to talk about what we're supposed to talk No, 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 no. <laughs> but that, that's the name of it? Like, so, but, but that's kind of a discussion, right? I feel among cartoonists is just like, you know, uh, treating everybody like a human being. Like that, that's like something that's coming up. So like independent comics, like historically, when I think about like comics with an X or whatever, you know, and I think about um, the like hurricane of just men, like white men talking about women, white women talking about white women, and like just the hurricane of what that was versus what it is now, you know, like talking about R. Crumb, right. you know, like just the, just the sort of, um, the uh, unabashed uh, exerting of your agency as a white man was like a worthy spectacle for any right. comics back then. You know, like, uh, like oh, it's so, and, I, and I, I do think that what Crumb did is important, but I think it's, it is hilarious on some level to be like, oh, I'm so glad that that guy had the bravery to let us know exactly what he masturbates to. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Chester Brown, too. Got to see oh, he showed us technique. how he masturbates. Yeah, that's it's this weird little thing called the Chester. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ron Smith. <laughs> Thank you for uh, demonstrating, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so, Liz, when you were... When you were um, Don't hold back for my mom. <laughs> <laughs> you put your mom in, your front, in the front row in front of me. No, I didn't do it. My mom can do what she want to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's very nice that you're here. <laughs> Um, I was, I was going to ask Liz, um, kind of what, did you feel like you had a place in comics when you were doing comics early on? Because you come very much from a, like, DC punk scene, as far as I understand, and how, it, it, that's, I mean, was it just Comet Bus around? Were you looking at? I don't think I've ever read Comet Bus. I thought actually. you needed to do that to get in the institution. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I mean, that's, I think the thing I took away most from punk is that you just, you know, you, there's there's no rules but the but the ones you make for your for yourself and mm. I mean you know we're talking about Marvel and DC and I know that it's unwise to ignore the influence that they have over you know as kind of you know their dominant position in greater society but they're not you know they just they just sell comics mm. they're not they're not comics I mean and I know that <laughs> Any scene, even our scene, you know, where we're very kind of close knit and very encouraging to one another, there's still a vein of conservatism that runs through that because anytime, anytime something brings you joy like this, you get protective of it and you wanna you wanna safeguard it. But I mean, it's it's, it's like raising a kid, you know, you can't you can't just keep your kid inside all the time and not let them socialize and go out. And I I think it's important to like, you know, not try and picture what comics could be and mold it into that but like really engage with changes as they come and be like okay that's fucked up so that needs to go and we need to work to make that go or that's good and we need to nourish and nurture that um you know that's i mean it's, it's a it's a growing thing and comics to me i mean you know i always had everybody's you know i think anyone who's ever drawn a comic has thoughts about like oh wouldn't it be cool if you know fanographics published my book or you know if I got to do a signing at a comic show and like meet people whose work I admire and talk to them as equals, you know, everybody likes that idea. I'm not going to pretend like I'm too cool for it, but um, that's not. At the end of the day, I mean, I'm I'm I've been drawn since I was a little kid. I'm probably going to draw till I die, and that's you know, it's like I said earlier. However, I can squeeze that in around my life. You know, comics are, I, I know you love comics and I love comics, but it's. Are, are you breaking up with comics? Yeah. <laughs> it's not you comics, it's me comics. <laughs> but um, it's just, it's really just a medium. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, we can bring so much into it. Influence from other stuff, the whole, you know, depth and breadth and length of the human experience 
and it's just like you know comics comics are not my soul comics are my body that my soul uses to walk around in the world you know and it's what i why comics is so important to me is not the form itself but that it's so accessible that it's that easy you know you can I, I, something sticks out of my head that you said years ago about how you can like get your paper and your pens out of a dumpster and still right. make like the best comic ever. That's mm. not everybody has to do it. Not everybody has the urge to. Everybody, you know, puts their love or whatever into the world in a different way. But you know, comics are cheap, mm. <laughs> and uh, I'm a cheapskate. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with you 100% about like it's going to be something like you know uh before the image thing happened i was like and i was talking to kelly sue about it and i was like yeah you know i gave it a shot you know i put out the book um there are other ways for me to tell stories there are other ways for me to make art you know like i'll try something else like i'm not going to sit here and be flogged for like you know at a certain point it's like yo you got to stay on your feet man like you know like uh, how many times are you going to try to do the same thing like you know so i thought about doing something else and then like you know that happened, you know, you get, <laughs> no matter how many times I try to get out, they keep dragging me back in, <laughs> you know? There's a, like a, a banging your head against the wall element mm. to doing comics. Mm. It seems like, uh, yeah, I do that a lot myself, like like beating myself up, like I'm, I'm doing this thing again, this exact same thing, <laughs> so I'm frustrated, you know, it's like, but uh, I don't know, for me it's kind of like this like, uh, I don't know, it's almost like an addiction or a compulsion or something, you know? Like, I, I used to say, it's like, oh, I can't really do anything else but comics. It's like the only thing I really know how to do. And like, mm. I mean, I guess that's kind of, I'm not, you know, 100% true. I'm sure I could learn something else. But uh, yeah, it's just like, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, there's, it's definitely like a mixed bag of, uh, <laughs> you know, like depression, and anxiety and whatever. And it's like, I don't know how much like, <clears throat> That fuels my comics, or me making comics fuels that. <laughs> <you know? laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. Like I'm, yeah, I'm definitely like you said. I'm like cartoonist for life. I think at this point, right. you know. <laughs> it's something. I, when I was younger, I really had this idea that like comics were kind of the be end, the be all end all of 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 the artistic uh, expression that I wanted to be part of. And then um, when I when I uh, met the the creature that I married, Marion Churchland, uh, who does comics as well but didn't really care about comics. It's like one of those things is just like, where I met her and she's better at this thing that I've devoted my life to than me, and doesn't really, like, she's like, eh, I could give her, like, I kind of want to do abstract painting. And, <laughs> and I feel like that's something, um, on some level, I, I get that feeling from all of you, like you're less, and, and maybe that's, that's why I find all of your work so interesting, is it's not, you're not, and I, I like, I like stuff that I basically equate as like fan art, but you guys all feel like you're pulling from things out from your actual lives and from art outside of outside of comics. Like I'm mm -hmm. always joking that I cannot have a conversation with Ron without asking uh, Marion about what he's talking about. <laughs> he sent me an email. There was an email chain. It was like me, you, and Paul Pope, and mm. you guys were talking, just casually talking about Machiavelli's The Prince, <laughs> and I was like, all right, I know about Tupac. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, and I had to ask Marion what the hell you're talking about. And I was about. like, Machiavelli and Machiavelli are two different things, right? You know I can't That's spell. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I mean, is that, is that something, do you guys need to engage with some type of art? Do you, do, you, do you have stages where it's music more at one point, or film more at one point, or books? Or does it matter? I don't know. I mean... I read I read like prose fiction at the rate of like one or two books a year, but mm. I read a lot more comics. I watch a lot of TV usually while I'm drawing comics. Oh, nice! It's amazing you can do that. <laughs> you do that too, Farrell, right? Yeah, uh, more recently. I mean, I used to be very opposed to that. Like people would tell me that, and it just seemed crazy to me that people could, you know, like focus on two different things. Or, but uh, there's something nice about having something that you don't have to like invest yourself in. You kind of have on in the background, and I don't know. It's uh, you know, you do something uh, long enough and then you're, I mean, you, you talk about this a lot, but they're trying to, uh, you know, mix it up to make it more interesting to you, you yeah. know? So I get, I get, you know, bored of doing the same, you know, having a routine, you know, it's comes, you know, gets kind of boring or depressing or whatever. So, uh, you know, it's kind of, how, how can I make this, uh, there's no reason I have to be, you know, I'm not going to an office or anything. I mm -hmm. can do this wherever, you know. It's, uh, I love the idea that the internet has made uh, the life of being a cartoonist to be less of a 
depressing, lonesome mm -hmm. thing than people <laughs> used to like to complain about in the past. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, uh, and maybe it's bad social media works that way, but I will like sit and draw in front of my computer and just like type things publicly on the internet while mm. I'm just like not paying attention, <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know. Yeah. Well, it depends on what you're doing too. Like, um, you know, if you're doing more like writing stuff or yeah. like for, you know, yeah. if you're trying to lay out a page or something, it's like, yeah, you need some relative silence. Yeah, yeah I actually yeah. have to go to a coffee shop to do layouts half the time just because I won't sit in front of the computer. And do I it. did that on accident the other day. I went to chill with a, a friend. She needed to get out of her place. She does like, I don't know, blogging or something <laughs> and like so She's one of these kids with their rock and roll <laughs> yeah, <you know? laughs> um uh jean brooks actually like feminist blogger i guess or no she does like tech stuff okay but i she that's what she does now yeah but she does like uh hacking stuff so um so i went to the cafe and i just started to draw and i ended up breaking down like a whole episode of this thing i was working on i was like oh so this works usually i'm just there to like get out of the house right. you know mm -hmm. spend like half an hour 45 minutes just with like some coffee in front of me whether or not i drink it and be you know it's like a luxury for me to just you know watch people and like be around people mm -hmm. passively interact with them mm -hmm. you know because you spend a lot of time by yourself yeah that's ever true liz have you ever had periods where you just did art no as you've always had like a another thing to remind you that you like to to draw more than that thing well yeah and a lot of times it's just it's felt like just two jobs you know and I mean it's still I mean it was I guess somewhere in there I still retained the sense memory of like why doing the art was important to me and why I have the compulsion to do it naturally but you know it doesn't always feel like that a lot of times I'd come home from my day job and then sit and like work on my pages and be like, all right, well now I'm off the clock for that and I can actually like talk to my husband and pet my dogs and get some sleep and it's, I mean, it, it comes and, it comes and goes, you know, I mean, I, I, I know that we talked last night about how for some people the compromise is you know, you do your comics work and you have to take work that maybe you don't like because uh, you got to eat or you do like me and you try and squeeze comics in around a job that you hate because you've you know you've you've got to eat and but you know life is suffering either way so you, <laughs> you just gotta <laughs> you just gotta find the joy no matter what you do <laughs> i thought you said the hardcore scene not the goth scene <laughs> <laughs> Take or, that personally. No, no. <laughs> Take exception to that remark. It's going to be a fight. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Or, or I feel like um, with not very well planning it out, I, uh, I kind of conditioned my life to this idea where I was like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. If I realize that I can work a day job less mm. if I spend less money, and so you mm. live like a monk, mm -hmm. and like uh, I was reminded me and Farrell were talking about when I lived in New York and I lived in a, an apartment across the street or across the hallway from a real apartment, and I had to go there to use their bathroom and kitchen. Mm. And then um, I, I didn't have, I just had a pay phone across the street I'd use. <laughs> and all I owned was a clock radio. And, uh, and I'd figured out exactly how much, how many porn comics I had to do in a, in a given month to survive. And I, I always made it exactly to that line. There was, it was never over that line. How did that work like uh, economically? Were you, did you get paid off of hits or like $50 a page? I remember that, right? It was yeah, it was 50, 50 bucks a page. page. And so I used they, to. Wow, I mean, at least they paid you. That's better than like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what's, oh yeah, NBA. But they would reject pages if they didn't comics? have enough that's sex. That's a better rate them. than them. <laughs> what's that? <laughs> what's the, what's the, what's, is it Boom? Yeah, <laughs> that's oh, better boom. than Boom's rate. I, I had a funny interaction <laughs> with Boom uh, where I was like, I was kind of, they had their push comics forward thing and I was mm. kind of joking with them on Twitter where I was just like, I was like, um, do, you, do you guys not pay people very well? Because <laughs> they, they were doing like adventure time things. Mm. And there's all these stories where people will do like a, um, they'll be like, oh, I did a cover for their comic. And then I went to the mall and saw it on a tote bag and they mm. paid me 50 bucks. Mm. And it was, and you sell three of those and I would've got my money back. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just walk out of there with all the fuck bags. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Be up on the yeah. internet. Like. Well, it's interesting because something, hopefully, something that we're that we're hitting on here is the idea of like an honest conversation about about mm. things. Because because a lot of publishers are very like, like they were immediately like, hey, we'll send you the information offline. And I'm like, I'm not working on your biography. I just like, <laughs> you know. and they send me Trying the information. Trying to blow your spot up real quick. That's <laughs> what. And I, I don't agree with. I, I get 
their moral idea of why they want to keep their company going mm. and they they put a little bit of money aside for them and mm. money aside for the thing and i don't personally agree with that but i understand how it's their their way of rationalizing mm. it but it's weird um yeah it just it, it feels a little less honest when that's not like a public conversation mm. and other people are like planning their lives around like i'm going to make a, a living as comics because I, I always had these like I had very high hopes as a kid. Like mm. I'm gonna, my first comic job was 30 pages. My first paid comic job was was 30 pages for 100 bucks. Oh wow! And I was trying to schedule my life around that. You mm. know, like all right. Yeah. So my mom is about to cry in the front row. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but then there's those times, like you said, it's it's all it's all a thing. Yeah. yeah. And like and because I scaled back and then like got to a point where I'm actually surviving. I don't know what to do with it now. Mm. Like I never planned on people caring about my work. I'd very much resigned myself. Like, like hey, I'm just gonna do this and, mm -hmm. and scrape by, and then and then something blows up a little bit, and you're just like, oh wow, I have to rearrange all of my plans. Wow, man, because like people caring about the work is very important. Uh, I'm not gonna say it's make or break, but I do feel like, and it's maybe something I have to admit, and I'm embarrassed to admit, but it's maybe a um, comics in particular. It's like my way of reaching out to people, kind of. Mm -hmm. Like it's a weird sort of, it's like a message in a bottle. Like I put, I put the comic out, and then it's like, like who's gonna pick this up? You know what I mean? Like who's gonna, who's gonna read this and be like, okay, ah, oh, he was talking about that. Like that connected to me in this way. And I think it was a stupid idea because sometimes I put the message out, and it means something different to someone else, and they come back and it's like, yo, I totally, yeah, like man, yo, like you know. I hate, you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna say it. It's like, <laughs> like you know, they'll, they'll come back with a different message, right. you know, that makes me even feel like, wow. Yeah, but that's kind like, of exciting. Did, 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 did I say it's, that, though? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Treating comics like a dialogue instead of a, a commodity is, I mean, that's, that's what's gonna stand the test of time, mm. you know? Right. I mean, it's the, the age of, you know, Marvel and DC is, I don't think it's that long for this world, and you know, 50 years it's gonna look, you know, they'll probably be like all movie based, or that might even have, have busted for them. I don't think they're gonna be around, and you know, who cares if they are or mm. not? But it's, you know, if it's, I mean, humans have been using like storytelling and cave paintings to communicate with each other since we came out of the trees. So if, you know, that's what's gonna endure, and treating the comics, you know, medium as something that anybody can access instead of, you know, you've got to like pay your dues and really scrape and struggle and suck up to the right people so that, you know, because I mean, some of it's about money and a lot of it's about exposure when people talk about, you know, making a living or, you know, working for one of the big companies. But, um, you know, how many people have gone into the, you know, taken that route and then regretted it or yeah. burned out on it or, you know, felt like it. It kind of, I remember uh, Dylan Horrocks in the intro to um, Hicksville talking about how he did some Batman work for years and then he just couldn't oh, yeah. he couldn't draw anymore. <laughs> I don't I don't want to get to that point where where it makes me hmm. miserable. So I mean, why why bother? <laughs> yeah, there's that Hicksville quote, the Jack Kirby quote at the start, which says, "Comics will break your heart." And um, I remember like that was um, I, I I think about that a lot because Kirby you know had to deal with Stan Lee and all mm. these unpleasant things and and I don't think. I think it's important to qualify that like comics won't break your heart, but like people trying to bleed, squeeze all of the money out of your art will, mm. will, will make your life really unpleasant. I heard that quote was uh, uh, actually said to James Romberger. Yeah. Uh, oh. Wow. Uh, he uh, yeah he was I guess talking to Jack Kirby and he's like, don't do comics. Comics will break your heart. You know. And I think yeah. Dylan heard that in, right. in Hicksville. Mm. He's behind them with a notepad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, um, Romberg is great if you guys don't know. Oh, yeah. He's got great work. This yeah. work's fantastic. But, uh, you know, that, uh, what you were talking about, Liz, about the finding the pens in the trash can, that's from the uh, back of King City, right? The page in there about, like, on your feet, yeah. soldier, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, I wonder how many people you've inspired uh, on this. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> awesome from thing, that is the page, idea of yeah. the conversation of stuff. And, like, mm -hmm. um, it's funny how many... Um, I, you really like, I feel like something really I really enjoy is how you really create your audience with the type of work that you read. Mm. Not to make it sound like some marketing team or anything, but like, you know, you've sat no, next to... No, I think that's the relationship you were talking about. That, yeah, you like, sit next yeah, to people that do work that is not as personal to them, and you, like, like it sucks. Like, I know some very wonderful people that do superhero comics and have people mm. just come up and complain to them about what they did wrong. Mm. <laughs> and like, 
if you're doing your personal work, ideally people will, you're, you're reaching people on a different level. Mm. Well, they'll still complain and tell you you did things wrong. It's just stuff that's from inside you instead of something that someone else <laughs> right, gave you to work right. on. But well, that's I mean, fantastic. That's, I, I get that's all the kinds human condition. Of, <laughs> I get all kinds of advice like that, you know, what you did wrong or what you should be doing or you should make t-shirts or you should do this. Or, and it's like, it's weird, like uh, people's perception of like what it's like to actually make a comic book. Mm. It's like... Uh, like no one understands how like everything is work. Mm. Like everything, you know, <laughs> like doing a Kickstarter. That's like a, having mm -hmm. a full time job or something like that. You're it's, not drawing pages while you're doing exactly. The it's all. I feel like any anything like that is just like a distraction from what I should be doing. And like, but you have to do a lot of. You have to do a lot. Answering of emails yeah. and getting back to whoever and all that stuff. It's I was, just like I was mentioning last you know, night the idea of like, like I have that thing now where it's like I'm always trying to convince myself. To, to remind myself how fun comics are. Yeah. And I'll do that thing where it's like, I'll answer a bunch of emails and I'll be like, okay, I'm not gonna answer this email, I'll answer this other email in an hour and I'll, but I'm, I'll be drawing and I'll be like, oh, I'm totally getting away with something now that I'm drawing and then it'll hurt me <laughs> like, oh, this is my job and if I never answered that email, it would be fine. Yeah. Yeah. But, so it's yeah sometimes cool. you itch, you just wanna draw. But you gotta, yeah, that oh, is. I don't, and the emails seem like they just keep humming. You yeah, know? nobody likes sending emails, it's weird. <laughs> well, it's not just, it's not just sending, I feel like there's like a, a like a compulsion in me to like, uh, like have to respond to everybody that, that sends me anything, you know? I'm just like, oh, I don't want that person to think I'm being a dick or anything, so I have to like write them a long response and like, I don't know, just kind of more recently I've been trying to like sort of filter someone. I was like, what's the worst thing that happens if I don't get back to this person? <laughs> it's just like some random person will be, you know, I mad read, at me or something. It's just like, I'm just gonna I read Robert Heinlein's, uh, they published his letters. Uh, the science fiction author, author Heinlein, and um, a huge amount of his letters is just him talking about ways to keep up correspondence, and eventually it's like him and his wife come up with this like postcard system where they just check a box, like, thank you, and send it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. we, could, we could start answering questions if anyone has anything. There's a, there's a microphone that I think they're sitting to set up in the, in the middle here, or it's way in the back, sorry, if anyone has any. It's moving. <laughs> yeah, if, any, if anyone has any questions, then you can line up at that thing. Or we can just keep talking about bullshit. <laughs> There's a, um, speaking of bullshit, I, uh, <laughs> my, uh, <clears throat> my uh, thesis advisor, who's actually now the head of, uh, um, or the department chair of the illustration department at School of Visual Arts, uh, he would give me a hard, such a hard time, like, um, during the uh, school year and stuff like that. But I remember this specifically, this uh, kind of speech he had at the end in the last class about like, you know, okay, his career as an illustrator. And I was doing an illustration portfolio and a cartooning portfolio just because I, want, I felt like I needed to do that too. And I had a full-time job and was interning somewhere at Marvel actually. Um, <clears throat> I'm not trying to brag. I don't want you guys to treat me any differently. <laughs> I worked really hard. Um, but he, he said something like in that, like, he's like, well, this is what you can do. You can do this, you can do this. And he's like, or you could just, you know, try to live on the fringes of society for a while. And, you know, and then I, you know, it's, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And I, got, I, I feel like basically that's what I've like turned my life into, you know, it's just like, oh, I'm kind of like, like that thing he was talking about. It's like, I just, <laughs> just so I can, you know, keep making my own comics, you know, for a living, you know, it's just like, I'm kind of like a... Yeah, like a fringe existence or something. <laughs> That's a good life. You got a great I'm, output, though, man. I'm not mad about it. No. You're doing really good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I had this funny joke that I wanted to work in to, like, one of the panels, but I haven't had a chance to work it in. I into. think it's time. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, um, I was like, ah, oh, that's funny. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I wanted to talk about how, like, the Justice League is, like, I don't know, three, three white dudes and like a white woman and then like a black guy who's literally three fifths of a human being. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't find a way to work that in. This <laughs> you gave us a setup, we can yeah. write around. Yeah. <laughs> Would it be the, the incredibly inclusive, ju uninclusive just us <laughs> thing? Uh, there's, a, there's a microphone fifths. back there too, if anyone like, wants You to didn't think about that, three fifths of a human being. Which, oh, you're talking about, is it cyborg, cyborg, right? Oh, cyborg, nice. <laughs> I thought he was in Teen Titans. Oh, is he in well, Teen now? Titans? I don't know. <laughs> I saw a picture with him in like Wonder Woman. Oh, no, he is. Everybody. Yeah. So I figured that's like, just <laughs> <laughs> You got a question? Yeah, I hope I can make this question concise enough. It's kind of for everybody, if anyone else has comments as well. Like, 
we keep talking about Marvel, and they have, have had some series where they were trying to inter introduce different levels of diversity. Arguably, even DC have had a few experiments Certainly. recently. I've literally you know, heard them say that, well, we're canceling these books because the fans didn't buy them, and it's not our fault we didn't make money on them, but we tried. So what would you do if you were approached by <coughs> a major publisher and asked to be part of one of these experiments, knowing you know, that it might work, it might influence people, maybe it wouldn't, but it would still influence people, or are you totally done with all that sort of stuff? Liz, were you ever approached by any of these people recently, like last week? <laughs> <laughs> well, not last week. Um, yeah, I, um, it's funny, you might see uh, Kathy G. Johnson sitting in the back there. I got the email while I was in the middle of writing an email to Kathy from um, someone at DC who um, was very kind, you know, and, and said some very nice things to me in the email and asked me about contributing to a nice, like, uh, we really want to take this one character in a really queer punk rock direction and, you know, we think you would be great for that and I stopped, you know, in the middle of this email that I was writing to Kathy and I was like, okay, my instinct is to, you know, send them and the horse they rode in on away in no uncertain terms, but do you think that it's worth it to, you know, do what you were talking about, which is try and change the system from within? And Kathy made the excellent point that, you know, it's, it's not on us to, you know, try and carve that space out for ourselves. We need to be met where we are. Um, you know, it's, it's up to them, you know, with, with the power to, I mean, you know, I didn't say it. <laughs> and I, you know, so of course I, I ended up being like, you know, thank you, but no thank you. I'm, I'm not very interested. And it's, I mean, you gotta, you gotta keep your eyes open for people who just wanna kind of co-opt your street cred to make money. Mm. There's some people who, I mean, I definitely think that there's, there's room for people who just don't want to go down that road, and there's room for people who have the energy and the ability to compromise in the smartest possible ways that makes them able to do change from the inside. But you got to recognize whether you're one of those people or whether right. you're not. And I don't think I'm one of them. I, I don't think, think we I could do it. I think we talked about this last night a little bit. Um, Kelly Sudakonik, who's a, who's a writer who I'm very fond of, um, did a uh, did a bunch of Marvel work, and I I, I felt that I got a chance to interview her and. Uh, thanks for your question, by the way. And I got a chance to interview her, and I was like very blunt about like, why do you work for these horrible people? And she had a, a, a response that I was really impressed with, where she talked about how a lot of the ideas that she was pushing were kind of bigger than, than uh, you know, kind of very important. Like she, her putting out feminist work with um, with female characters written by a woman in a way that kind of empowers young girls to the largest audience she possibly could was kind of worth. Um, you know, the awkward emails and the people not treating her with nearly as much respect as, as it did. And luckily now she's not working for them anymore, but, uh, but I thought that was really valid. It's also, a, I mean, this is going to sound whack maybe, but it's also a job. Sure. You know, like, um, I don't know, like, so when I was doing, I was doing some work for Vertigo every once in a while, I took all of the work that wasn't like, a, I didn't take any Trojan horse jobs. Like, they offered me this one crime book and I'm reading the script, it's by like an Italian guy, like not like a guy, you know, from Bensonhurst, but like a guy from like Italy, you know? And he was writing this story about LA, about a, about a black man in LA who, uh, I was crazy, and like, he's, there are Mexican gangs involved, they're like all of these really specific groups, and at first I'm reading the script and I'm like, well, I wanna draw this, but like, I, you know, at the time I hadn't been to LA yet, I was like, I don't really know I don't know what like I don't know like what LA looks like or feels like, right? Um, so I'm probably going to turn this down. Then I got to this one part where it was like, it was like some guy, some Jamaican guy who was talking about like Holly Selassie and like he was like, yeah, Holly Selassie from like Syria or something, right? And so I'm like, okay, I'm not Rastafarian, but I'm pretty sure he's from Ethiopia. <laughs> <laughs> and so like I sent the mail back and I was like, look, I can't do this job, right? Um, thanks for offering me the work. And also you might wanna like, uh, check, you want facts. check some of the facts. <laughs> like, you know, I'm not trying to be a dick about it, but like saying, you know, yeah, Haile Selassie maybe was the emperor of Ethiopia. <laughs> um, 
I listened to a Bob Marley record. <laughs> and, and like, yo, but I didn't hear back from that editor for a good long time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? And people wonder, like, oh, I, someone said today, they were like, oh, there's not a whole bunch of your work. And it's like, mm, no, there isn't. You know, but like, so I'm just doing some, I'm gonna do some ad work. Like, I'm gonna do the, you know, the work that comes and pays the bills. And I'll still doodle and I'll draw my little stuff or I'll write my stories, talk to Julian about little stories, hypothetical stories and stuff, you know, and maybe put out a comic when I have some time, you know, like, but it's like, that's, in the end, it's a job. Like, I, I don't think, I think you're right. I don't think you should do something. You shouldn't, like, sacrifice, you know, or have someone use your, like, identity you know, uh, sell your identity as a commodity like that is really gross. And like, I've had a hard time like thinking about it, how I may even do it accidentally. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, are, are people drawn to this work because uh, like the human aspect or like, are they drawn to the commodity like of my identity and they're like buying into that? It's kind of like a weird thing to think about sometimes. Yeah, and you gotta like, if you get into it, you gotta be aware of what's going on mm -hmm. because otherwise they're just, they're just gonna use you, Yeah, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like a, I think there's like a, a pearls before swine aspect to it, uh, too, because like, um, I did, I kind of like did a, a, a thing for Marvel, like a 10 issue thing that was, uh, happened because of the, uh, the writer was a, a, a famous prose writer, and that's why I agreed to do it, because I really liked this writer's work, and, um, I guess there was some, I found out this later, but there was some stuff that happened at Marvel, was the, the original editor uh, that approached the writer to do the series, um, I think they asked him, like, you can do whatever you want, and he's like, oh, I'm gonna use this, like, obscure character from the 70s, and, uh, you know, switched editors at some point, and uh, they didn't, like, promote it at all, and, like, uh, I don't, uh, yeah, and, like, they even, like, remaindered the books and sold them to, like, you know, retailers and stuff for a dollar each and didn't tell me about, because I would've mm -hmm. bought cases of them. Um, so it's just kind of, like, you know, like, not that I have any street cred, but I think the author certainly did, and, it, like, you know, the book, tanked and I think it would have done really well with just like a little bit of you know like marketing effort or like or even just kind of like thinking outside of like okay we're this might not do that great in a lot of comic book stores but we should try to get this into bookstores and things like that you know and you know the writer I don't think he had like much invested in it um, but you know to me that was kind of like uh, I don't know like a little heartbreaking that like you know, I was like, I mean, I, but it also at the same time, it, like you said, it was a job. Like, it, mm -hmm. I got a page rate. I, you know, I got to do, you know, it took me like two years to do 10 issues, but, you know, <laughs> I could, you know, live off that, you That's know, pretty issues. easily. Yeah, you know, so. They give you um, a going rate for your soul. Yeah. But, it, you know, I, the rate hasn't gone up at all since mm -hmm. I started doing, you know, like I, I, I figured like, you know, doing like work for Marvel or DC at some point, like, okay, you're going to. And this might just be, you know, my folks, and or it might just be like the state of the world. But uh, you know, I figured, like, the more work you do, the the more your rate would go up. And uh, it hasn't changed since like 1999 or whenever what I started about your doing rent, professional though? work. What about your rent? My rent, yeah, has yeah, significantly increased. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you have a question about this? Sure. Um, uh, you were talking about the humanizing factor of artists, and sometimes when you come to an event like this, you see you just see finished books and a face, mm -hmm. so it's kind of like hey, you're elevated to a level. Mm -hmm. Can you guys talk about what, like a day in uh, a day in the life of production of a comic book? Like, mm -hmm. got to go get groceries, got to do the laundry, do a couple pages. What you know? What individually? What do you do? in a day. You just so, described mm -hmm. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think, I don't know of anyone that like has it like systematized to that degree, like in a daily aspect, you know? I mean, maybe they're, actually yeah, there's one guy I can think of is Craig Thompson. Like, um, he used to live in, uh, he just moved to Los Angeles, but uh, I would go over to his house every once in a while and he actually had that. He's like, I do about 150 pages a year. Uh, and he would every day, he would, you know, once he start, actually started like the production part, you know, the, the drawing part, he would wake up in the morning, pencil for three hours, get a page penciled, and then like spend the rest of the day inking it. And if he wasn't done it at like a certain point, he would just stop the page, put it away, and then the next day he would start a new page. And then like, oh, interesting. so at the end, you know, he might do some cleanup here, like thing. And he actually is one of those guys that would, would actually takes pages out. You know, like I, I can't do like I, I have to everything I've drawn. Like I have to put all this mm. in because I could do all my editing, you know, up here or on the you know uh, thumbnail stages or what, whatever. But uh, 
Yeah, it's just like a, a, a really different way than what I work or I, any other cartoonist that I know works, but that seems like so much like the ideal, you know, like perfect, like, oh, this guy has the perfect cartoonist life. Like if you had a life, fictional you know? cartoonist, they would yeah. work like great. <laughs> mm. yeah. I wish I could do that, man. Yeah, me too. Oh, you know, like amazing. you see back in the day, the painters that wear like, they wear a suit and they're painting. Uh -huh. like, that's how I imagine like cartoonists with like a suit on, like, dun, yeah. dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah. I wish I could do that. Well, I mentioned, Liz, you probably have to have for a schedule if you have a schedule for your day job. Mm. Yeah, I mean, when, I'm, when I was working on the book, it was basically just, you know, get up, take care of the dogs. Um, you know, I work from, uh, from noon to 8.30 most days when I don't have overtime, so I just spend all morning, um, you know, getting as much done. And I, I really developed a real kind of uh, economy of style. Mm. Um, it, it doesn't look the way I feel like my art would look in an ideal world, but it's fast, you know, mm -hmm. and that was... That's comics. Yeah, that really, uh, <laughs> it was a big part of, you know, you know, making it functional. But, um, you know, I'd, I'd work on my pages until it was time for me to go to work, and then I'd work for eight hours and come home and eat and go to bed. That's about it. I, I sometimes, it sounds like... A horrible asshole thing to say but I sometimes long for when I had a day job because yeah. I remember like I would work at the Strand bookstore in, in Manhattan for a while and I would like my lunch break I would be so excited that I get to draw for an hour and then at the end of the hour I'd be like I could be 10 minutes late and I just like <laughs> keep pushing it and pushing it and now I just like wake up and I'm like I got something to do in like three months <laughs> <laughs> like I'm always, I'm always still really amused when I have like serious days and I feel like I'm like getting stuff done and everything and then I like, and then I like catch an image of myself and realize that I've been in my underpants for like 10 <laughs> hours <laughs> and like been like having serious discussions with people online and like sending off work and like. I put on pants for phone calls. I, used to like that. That's, I like that. I used to have work pajamas and, and sleeping pajamas. <laughs> no, I like sometimes I like to, I like to get dressed up when I'm gonna have a phone call, you know? I, I just feel like my body is in the space where my mind needs to be. I always put on a shirt for Skype. If yeah. somebody like, <laughs> he's, got, he's got like a quarter shirt, like a button, yeah. button down, right? Both, and then like a tie and they both yeah. end, like right here, <laughs> just the shoulders. <laughs> Esther, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, okay, so I'm actually really, really, really supremely interested in your various relationships with editing and editorial. Like, you know, working with various editors, which you guys have actually discussed and like, you know, written comics about and stuff. But also to like being your own editor and then maybe being the editor for other people. Right, certainly. What? Yes. <laughs> wait, wait, did you already talk about that? What's that? Did you already talk about no, that? No, no, oh, no, no. I was okay. just agreeing with, yes, that, that's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. did, Liz, did you have an editor on, a, a very intense editor at all with, on your Sacred Heart book? No, um, I mean, Eric Reynolds was kind of my, um, you know, once, um, there's Neil. Neil uh, got me set up with the, with the contract with um, <laughs> Fanagraphics because it's, it's not something that I, you know, had even occurred to me to, to try to do. Um, but you know, Fanographics is my f my first to this point experience with any kind of professional publishing machine, and they're pretty hands off. You know, they gave me a really fair contract and you know complete creative control. And when I turn, you know, they gave me the time to because I I had drawn the first 200 pages of the book and posted <laughs> it online as I went along, and they gave me the time to redraw all of those, um, which I did which I was glad for because the early stuff was really, you know, it needed editing. <laughs> um, it definitely benefited um, from the time it took to edit myself. And then, you know, when I, when I turned in the book, I, I don't think they, they asked, they didn't ask me to make any changes or anything. And nice. it, was, it was pretty painless. But I'm, like I said, I'm glad I had the chance to go back and edit it because for me at least, my first instinct is never like my best one, mm. so. I've had both really good and really bad experience with editors. Um, that I had when I was first when I was working on on the first half of King City at Tokyo Pop. I actually had a really uh, good editor named Troy. Who um, I, it always sounds really backhanded when I tell the story, but basically he would give me he would suggest he liked the work a lot, and that was really cool. And he would suggest ideas that felt very like um, he was 
he was like, like the end of King City, which um, annoys some people, is very anticlimactic. And the um, and he would very much uh, give me ideas like, oh, you should have a, you should have guys that are like, can, that ride wolves and like you have a big battle in the middle of the city at the end. And he'd kind of give me what he was most excited about, and then I had a chance to subvert that. Mm. And it was really nice to be able to That's have important. that conversation. I love that ending of King City. I love that. I know a lot of people were frustrated with it, but I thought it was, I thought it was great. Thank you. <laughs> it was funny. Um, so yeah, I think that, and it's interesting now because I am editing other people and. Um, my my main thing I, I have, I have some minor things where I, I, it's important to have a conversation of what you expect from people and, um, you know there, there's, yeah you know, communication is the main thing but when when I'm working with people on their own work like I'm I'm editing this mag island magazine now with uh, my friend Emma Rios, and we basically like, uh, have to put people who we who we trust in it and say do what you want to do because I think I would. I don't want to get in, I, I wouldn't put someone in there whose work I, I, who I didn't think of as like a competent artist and adult, and I, I don't want to tell someone else how to, how to, um, how to approach their own work. And I think that's important. And, and for me, there's that freedom of, of knowing that um, no one's, you don't have to, like when I was, when I was working on porn comics, there was, they would literally not take or publish or pay me for pages that didn't have enough sex on them. Hmm. So it was like this total second guessing where the story became ridiculous because I was like, and then they're having sex in the background through the window here while well, we establish these people have names. <laughs> and, uh, and it's just so nice to, to be able to be like, the lines that I put on the paper are going to go to print and no one is gonna, if, it's, it's very Emperor's New Clothes though because there's like, no one's gonna tell you if you walk out of the door with no pants on and tell you're outside. <laughs> and, but that's kind of fun too. <laughs> A couple times in the uh, what was it, in the discussion, you guys mentioned that in in some cases, uh, the comics that you guys do end up being a dialogue between yourself and your audience, uh, and sometimes with dialogues, as you mentioned before, things get a bit a uh, bit mm. messed up, going one direction, sometimes come back interpreted incorrectly, come back the other way, sound completely different. How often would you say that in your personal works you run into kind of a death of the author situation where the thing that you're trying to say uh, is completely misinterpreted? Not in a bad way necessarily, but just it, what, what you were initially trying to say isn't what was apparently heard and you get something back that's completely different, whether good or bad. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, I had an experience with, uh, I, I, uh, I write this comic called Prophet that uh, a lot of people in reviews have found very confusing, <laughs> and uh, and I I wonder sometimes if that's because um, I'm, I'm a lot of my influence is coming from from European comics, and uh, a lot of the readers might be coming from superhero comics that have a little more handholding of things, and maybe it's just confusing to everyone but me, mm. but um, but for a while, me and my friend Simon that I was working on the scripts with were very. We, we tried to make things super clear, and I think it was almost like a compromise that I wish we hadn't done at some point, mm. because um, I, I think a lot about the difference between like active artwork and passive artwork, where, where a passive thing is like you um, take in the work and it asks nothing of you, and you're done with it when you're done with it. And an active thing is something that maybe doesn't give you all of the answers, so you th think about it afterwards, and you're just like, why do they do that? And even like bad work, I think, is sometimes more engaging because you're like, why would, you know, you know that it makes no sense. Why well, there's something to be said too for like having like a, you know, like a, you know, committing to a bit or something. You know, like yeah. you know, having like a singular vision of like, um, I don't know. For me, I mean, you guys, you know, saying comics are a conversation. Like, uh, you know, I I think like for me, I feel like it's more of like a monologue or something. Like right. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not good at like speaking obviously uh but <laughs> so I, mean, I chose comics as a way to like i like telling stories and uh i want i want to tell the stories i want to tell and i you know even like the you're talking about like dealing with editors like i don't think i've had a bad experience with an editor because i've i've never really been edited like um hmm. i mean I've, I've worked with you know several different editors and i've never had to like change anything uh as far as like you know my stories uh go so uh I don't know, for me it's like, um, 
I kind of, it's not that I don't care what people think about my work. Like, obviously, I like approval, and I like, I want people to understand what I'm doing. And, um, well, like, with the profit stuff, uh, for example, like, uh, to me, like, all that stuff, like, I, I would have to read the issues several times, but, like, to me, it wasn't about, like, well, this doesn't make sense or whatever. Uh, I read a lot of comics or move, watch movies or television shows because I like the way they make me feel, you know, like, um, and I guess that's kind of what I try to put across in my work is that, like, uh, more of, like, about a feeling or an emotion or, uh, you know, something like a memory that I have that, um, you know, means a lot to me. And I think that, you know, when you do that with this, like, you know, singular vision of, like, I'm going to do this the way I know it needs to be told, like, I think that, you know, like, the right kind of people will respond to that, you know, they can sense an honesty or, like, right. a truth and there's a type it, of, you know? there's a thing, I always think of it as, like, um, I don't know, it's like emotional currency. Like, yeah, if you have exactly. had experiences where you can relate to something, it's almost like you're spending the same kind of money. And if you go to another country where they don't have your, take your Canadian dollars, then it's, like, you know, it's almost like mm. it's people that have different experiences. And I think it's, I think it's kind of a fault sometimes to think that, that, every indie experience needs to be universal because mm. it's nice to, to finally connect with work and be like, this is something that I, I I've, this is something I've felt that I've never seen someone else convey. I'm but not if you're, but if you're thinking about like, oh, is this universal or not while you're making it, I don't know, to me, like that just seems like, uh, you know, you're, you're putting this like filter or something like while you're right. you know, trying to be creative, you know? So I think it's like, uh, yeah, like doing, yeah, like doing something honestly and, you know, subtle, subtlety or, Subtly, I don't know why I can't say that, but uh, <laughs> you know, there's like a you know weight weight to that that I think like uh, you know like uh, uh, you know a lot of people can respond to. Yeah, definitely. So, so like what I said, what I said, I was thinking specifically about when someone says like, "Yo, um, oh, I like Japanese stuff too." You know what I mean? Like I always oh, fuck, that gets. Me <laughs> It's like that, being misrepresented or something. Yeah, like everyone like, has different perceptions. Of, yeah, you know, you know and I it's like that's the that's like the commodity that you pick it up for. Like that's you know, you know, and that's cool. Whatever. Like I can't really respond. I, like I can't, and it makes it actually. It, I think it's really healthy because it makes me think. It's like, yo, am I presenting like some sort of a fetishized version of something? Like, is that like is that what I'm presenting? And like, am I offering this mm -hmm. for them? You know, and then it makes me sad. Well, that's. I need to be able, I need to um, maybe in some cases, I mean, that's why my next ninja comic is a, like, that's part of the dialogue. It's like, you know, uh, what, is, what does that mean? Like, and what does it mean to be influenced uh, by something in a way? Like, no one ever, no one ever points out my, um, like, no one would say, like, yeah, like, I'm really into European stuff. I like all the European stuff you put in your comic. It's like, no, you just take it for granted that, like, I'm going to be influenced by, like, the Western world, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And if it's not the Western world, or, like, you know what I mean? If it's not the Western world, then it's like, oh, that's a, that's a novelty for you, and you yeah. pick up on it. It's like, but you drove here in a Honda. You play a Game Boy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you watch, you know, like, you watch a TV from Japan, right? Like, all of your, everything is informed by it. Like Lautrec was informed by it. Like it's a, it's a long relationship we've had in Western in the Western world. So that sort of thing, it makes me careful about. Um, although I'm selling a com I'm selling a comic, like how I'm how I'm how am I able to undermine that sort of the the commodity of it, you know? Because that's what really grosses me out. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's it's horrible to think about that. Yeah, for me, like while I'm making it, but like, there's a, like after I'm done with the thing, then it's almost like trying to reverse engineer it. It's like, okay, how can I get this mm. to as many people as possible? <laughs> Yo, <laughs> Just in like, front of as many eyeballs as possible, at least, yeah. like give it, give it a chance to mm. be out in the world, you know? Yeah, it's like I made, I made a useless product, <laughs> right? Like I did not make a product, right? So like, you know, what am I, like, what am I doing? Like, yeah, anyway, but don't sell it then. Oh, yeah. I, Oh yeah, Dad, shall we run to the last two questions and then as we've run 15 minutes too late? <laughs> Hi, um, I'm not sure if this fits into the conversation, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, I've worked in news, animation, and restaurants, and in every industry there have been moments when I've been underpaid because I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. There have even been moments when I'm like in an office and then I hear, why are you paying her that much? She's a woman. And this is a struggle that I don't know, like, I don't know what to do. 
So I was just like, ooh, sorry. So I was just wondering like, what advice, what can I do to make sure that I'm getting paid what I want to get paid? It's really hard to... No, I'll get this, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's, it's a hard line to walk. You gotta, everyone's gotta really hustle on their own behalf, and I'm, I'm not good at speaking up for myself. I'm not good at advocating for myself. And it's, it's really been something I've had to learn, not in the comics world, because I've, I've been pretty much just working for myself, but in, in the rest of the, you know, everything else, the way I make my money, I just gotta, you know, you've gotta toe the line, you, you can't be too bitchy, but you've gotta, you know, you can't let them get away with stuff. And it's, you know, it's a tightrope act, and it's, it's not easy. There's no easy way to do it until they stop being so shitty about it. But, you know, that's, that's how it is in America, and there's still, like, you know, there's legislation that they're trying to get passed to, to make it more fair, and even that's still not, you know, grinding along. It's, you just gotta do what you can. <laughs> if I knew how to fix it, I'd tell you. <laughs> I mean, if anything, just discussing it seems, or at least being open about it is something more than yeah, I mean, that's the good thing about, I, I mean, I love living in the future. I think, I think the internet has been a wonderful tool for exposing a lot of things to, to sunlight that wouldn't have seen it before, you know, and they, they say sunlight is, is the best disinfectant. And I, I think it's, for all the problems we have in the world, you know, the visibility that we have through kind of a, a worldwide connection like the internet can only, can only help. Hmm. So. Zappy. Uh, so, hello. <laughs> um, it seems like there's, making comics is a very romantic thing. A lot of. <laughs> are you breaking my balls right now? <laughs> no, I'm not. You no, I, I, look, I think like we kind of had a little bit of a conversation and I did break your balls and I'm sorry. But I think it was a good conversation and it brought up a lot of things. So I wanted to s see how you look at making, like the act of making comics and how maybe your peers see their, you know, their practice or something. And then um, do you think of yourselves as romantic people in any way you want to apply that? And what does romance mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> I ain't answering that. <laughs> I actually use the word romantic a lot, but never about, you know, like, you know, a couple you know, or what, what have you, but, you know, I, I see it more of, like, an ideal, and it's, like, interesting you say that, because I, I mean, that's just something that sort of drives me crazy, is, like, people's, uh, I don't, you know, I probably think way too much about this, and I know, you know, people outside of whatever in my life don't think about this as much as I do, but, um, you know, people's perceptions of what, it, what it's like to be a cartoonist, and, uh, I mean, like you said, it's, like, it's all suffering, you know, <laughs> you know, so it's, uh, I, I, I see things as like, you know, oh, this, like, there's like a, you know, something romantic about like, you know, being, you know, going to a new city or, you know, you know, being in a different environment, but um, like the reality of it, it's just like, it's just like another, you know, another day, you know, I'm like, uh, <laughs> you know, like, you know, dealing with all these, you know, whatever, these things that, you know, life, you know, throws, throws at you and, uh, you know, it's just it's just about the work. You know, like I hear, um, I don't know if I, you know anyone's like a Neil Gaiman fan in here or not, but like that's <laughs> that speech he made uh, last year the Phil in Philadelphia. You know, actually was like really inspiring to me about like, you know, no, like making good art like no matter what. You know, it's like you lose your job or break up with a partner or what ha what have you, and it's like make good art all the time and like that's actually something like I tell myself. You know, like uh, you know I'm feeling depressed or whatever, and it's like well uh, you know. This is like my salvation, you know, doing this thing, you know, it's like, um, it might not be like always like enjoyable for me, but uh, I guess in that sense, you know, like if you think about it in this like, uh, like as a concept, it is romantic, but you know, it's like, you, <laughs> I know, just, you know, I don't think about that, you know, like all I the just time, imagine you know? Gaiman being just like, just like take those feelings and like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think romance uh, mostly means that you wear a cravat. <laughs> That's my take on it. You said you said cravat at some point, and it 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 
launched into like an hour long discussion about Lenny Kravitz's penis. <laughs> <laughs> when was this? Yeah. Uh, last night. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> I don't know if you hung around for that. Maybe you're just like. Yeah, no. <laughs> that's like the jump the shark situation. Yeah. <laughs> is, does Lenny Kravitz wear a cravat? Oh, the yeah, Lenny Kravitz scars. is actually the plural uh, of what a cravat is. If you have two cravats, oh. it's Lenny Kravitz. <laughs> I think I have Lenny Kravitz. Okay. Cravats. <laughs> say, uh, the only person I know wearing a cravat in modern times is uh, Austin Powers, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Zephy, did they answer your question at all, or are you just fucking with mom? <laughs> I, I think everyone would say that. I mean... <laughs> For me, I, I don't separate like the comics work I do or the urge that I have to make comics from anything else, you know, not consciously, but because I, I can't keep it separate from, you know, religion and relationships and, you know, punk rock and art and death and all of that stuff. And it's, you know, it's, it's just integrated. And sometimes that's, sometimes that's been very embarrassing for me because I'm a very, earnest and sincere and emotional person and you know that's um that's not very cool <laughs> but uh, even though you know in a nice kind of community like ours people will embrace you for it if you um you know if you're appropriate about it but it's you know that that real kind of you know I know I said earlier that life is is suffering but you know <laughs> comics and <laughs> You know, everything that we do to find joy in each other and to find joy in, in whatever time that we have on Earth is, you know, it's, it's up to us to make, to make the suffering count for something, you know, and to let it make it that much sweeter. Hmm. So maybe that's a romantic idea. I always think about the, uh, I think you quoted the, the Jaime Hernandez flyer he did. The, oh, yeah. the if the scene sucks, then you suck. That's right. <laughs> and it's kind of it's kind of nice because it is you know everyone everyone in a community is kind of responsible for the community they're in and, and making it pleasant and, and wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so romantic. That is a romantic idea. <laughs> I, I think uh, what I meant by it, and maybe it's uh, not using the word properly, but I think romance is kind of like. Being able to look at the mundane, you know, with like, a, that's why when people say, oh, they romanticized this, this thing, and it was a mundane activity, but they made it into something, and it could be negative, they made it into something more than what it is. But I kind of feel like sometimes uh, in art, um, there's an element of being able to romanticize the mundane like to, to take elements that could be overlooked and put them in a, in a new context, you know? So like, and something as stripped down as, or as abstract as like Duchamp, right? Could be, I think it could be a romantic act, like to, you know, whatever, recontextualize like a urinal, right? But maybe it's just, you know, like maybe I just meant critical thinking or like uh, observation. Maybe that's what I what, what a better way of expressing what I said. What I said was everything I do is ro like romantic, but I just said it in like a flippant way, right? Like I didn't mean for it to be taken seriously. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like something Lord Byron would say. Can I? Yeah. I didn't mean for it to sound that way, right? I, I just want to clarify that Ron was on the Miranda with a with single rose smelling when he said this. <laughs> it's pretty fucking romantic. Yeah. No. <laughs> should we let you guys? We could let you guys go now. Thank yes. you for uh, listening to us talk. Yeah.